Welcome. Thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, really appreciate you guys being here. This is the Invisible Hands Tending the Secret Greens. Uh, we are at DEF CON 26. And <laughs> maybe next year we can go to Caesars, but uh, we're glad you guys are joining us right now in the Valley of Fire. So essentially what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to give you guys a quick kind of high level macroeconomic slash strategic thinking talk. And typically macroeconomics are made very boring on purpose to kind of keep things obfuscated. Um, and a lot of what you hear and see is not the truth of what's really going on. <clears throat> so instead of like a conspiracy theory talk like you may have heard, this is actually a conspiracy fact talk so you guys can take your tinfoil hats off. And what we wanted to do is give you guys some tools that are actionable to actually start seeing the patterns that are actually going on in the world to kind of see social engineering at scale. Um, so I'm Keith. Uh, my background's in user experience, film sound, astrology. Uh, I did a talk last year in the SE Village about how to hack corporate culture. So if you Google DEF CON change agents, you can check that out. So we rolled that into some of this. Um, but I look at a lot of things very systemically and into complex systems. And uh, this is Frank. Hey everybody, my name is Frank. Uh, Cosmo Voltron is my handle that I'm uh, going through uh, identifying myself as for this talk. Uh, basically, uh, I come from the side of uh, marketing, strategic branding, and the consumer experience. Now basically, uh, this talk uh, is going to educate you on a few things about how cannabis has changed the world and how it will change the future of how humanity will continue through. <laughs> Uh, but basically, uh, this is a disclaimer. Uh, these opinions are our own. It's not legal advice, not investment advice. It's up to you to make your own decisions. Uh, think for yourself. Don't be evil. <laughs> so the basics, obviously, of why we're all here today is because weed. Weed is becoming mainstream. Is cannabis plus a, a look at what is our social contract going to equal a new awakening, a new enlightenment, a renaissance 2.0? So again, the goals of this talk is to entertain you guys, uh, educate you on how to look at the world and to see through the narratives and to empower you with that knowledge so that you can, as an individual, be yourself and empower the free will. Now, basically, we are all players in this game. Uh, each individual has their and purpose uh, to forward this experiment that is called humanity. We find ourselves stuck in a system where we are balancing the love for love and the need for money. I used here a, a, a line from Jackson Brown called, caught between the longing for love and the struggle for the legal tender. Now it's pretty much always been the same from the beginning. Uh, Neolithic man, started out as individuals, they came into clans, they found that collectively they can become more than just the individual. Uh, through time and space, they found that certain things they could unlock the secrets to. Um, the stars, fire, these were very important things that created civilization and allowed us to move forward. Now, Neolithic man uh, created fire with many different things, but it's said that he uh, would put cannabis on the fire, and it is through this relationship through fire and cannabis that Neolithic man became enlightened. <laughs> now, this enlightenment carried in through to free thought and individualism. Uh, it carried through in through medicinal purposes, medicines, Basically, cannabis all of a sudden became really the breadbasket of civilization. It's what brought humanity to be civilized, to start hunkering down and creating homes, farms specifically. No more hunting and gathering, they could just grow their own things. And it's said actually one of the first plants that was ever grown by man, specifically and farmed, was cannabis. Now cannabis Aside from clothing ancient man, building their homes, and creating what is our modern day farming societies, it also enlightened them 
through the use of cannabis, revered priesthood class, uh, people that were pretty much in charge of uh, keeping the knowledge for all of humanity and society, used cannabis to really open their minds and hearts to what is uh, the ability to think. Now this free throw and knowledge uh, created the ability to persevere past just what is the seen to the unknown. It was cannabis that was responsible for empowering uh, past man to go beyond the borders of what he knew, or they knew, I should say. It allowed them to create these, I should say, time machines or future exploring machines. Now, back in the day, these things were boats. These boats were made out of wood that was then sealed with uh, cannabis oils. Uh, the ropes and rigging was made from cannabis. The sales and the money derived from all of these products are directly responsible for us going beyond what was the unknown. So for, since the beginning of time and the beginning of humanity, cannabis really was the foundation of what is civilization. It created this wealth and it became the king of commodities. A hundred years ago, it really empowered the, the wealth of what is our own creation here in the United States. If it wasn't for hemp, we wouldn't have had the wealth or the wherewithal to forge on and create a new society based on the Enlightenment. Now, cannabis afforded the ability to go explore the world. Empires were built, and these empires then centralized wealth based on the king commodity of cannabis. Uh, this wealth generated power, and that power translated into control. Now, basically, what that represents more is about how to control society, but then to empower as well. Uh, there's a famous line from The Margin Call, the movie, and it goes something along the fact of, money was created so that people wouldn't just shoot themselves to buy a sandwich. Or shoot each other, I should say, <laughs> to buy a sandwich. So in essence, the social contract that was uh, created through nationalities was based upon the backing up of wealth and the empowerment of the individual. Now the empowerment of the individual had everything to do with making sure that the man could have free will and also the wherewithal to have the protections of justice and be able to live free and think free. Now, we are at a precipice where 10 years ago, 15 years ago, legalization is actually coming to the forefront. Now today, we have the ability to see that the future may be actually driven by cannabis. But that remains to be seen. Now, as marijuana goes Main Street, we understand that it's more about a war on cash. I mean, cannabis is the last of the commodities to be strictly derived and traded through on legal tender cash. The beauty about legalization is that it's now becoming a backdoor to renegotiate all of what is the social contracts around the world. Uh, it also has the ability to put humanity towards a path of renewable instead of finite. And through legalization, you're going to find that it's really about backstopping control and backstopping the existing social contract. It was such an important commodity to our founding fathers that they, a hundred years ago, saw fit to put it on the back of one of the most important bills they had, a $10 bill. Now, in 1919, a $10 bill is, should be, God, probably about $10,000, probably more. So for them to pick, depict this cash crop as the bedrock of the foundation of their nation, 
and really the fuel to empower the world and humanity via the Industrial Revolution, it was really the building block of what is our present day future. But what happened? Well, you're going to find that because we are going on a path of legalization, that the social contract that nation states have with their citizens needs to be renegotiated. It has to be. And it's actually being forced. Now, this nation state versus globalism is where it's really the nexus of all of what is wealth, power, and control. Now, legalization really is about re uh, redefining the social contract between people, state, and the world. I think a future of cannabis is really the future of humanity. Without it, we don't have a way to change ourselves from a finite to a renewable future. And really what it does is empowers humanity to then build the wealth and centralized with information, which is the new two commodities that will be the bedrock for our future. So why legalize now? Well, it really is going to empower the future of humanity and the individual. It's going to be the vehicle of free will versus feudalism. Now again, the social contract that we have today really is about the nation states' contracts with their citizens. By legalizing cannabis, the United States and other countries are putting themselves in direct contrast to what are the international norms and laws that are put in place. Kind of like what whoop, this dude was talking about a few years back, a new world order. What will that be? Is cannabis the antithesis of that? Or is it a way to empower people? Or will it then be used as a locus of control as it has in the past. Do you really want a future where the one person decides everything for it all? Or are we going to have or build a future that we empower each individual to really go after free will, free market, and freedom of thought? Now again, the basics of what we're going to be covering is everything needs to be renegotiated. Commodities, information, data, energy, petrochemical versus renewal, the social contract, all these come into play with legalization. What's really at stake is independent thought and individualism. That is what legalization really in its most pure form is about. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Keith. All right. So... To contextualize this and kind of ground this a little bit, we're going to break this down into kind of like five sections. One, the ultimate social contract. Two, you should never waste a good crisis. Three, we're going to look at entitlements, taxes, and payments. Fourth, we're going to look at renewables. And finally, we're going to look at what's a small market today is going to be a massive market in the not so distant future. So the ultimate social contract. <clears throat> when we talk about a social contract, it's this ethereal idea that we basically pay taxes, and for paying taxes, we get protected by the government. We have a military. We have a strong rule of law. If you go to, like, Venezuela or other countries, like, say, Iran or wherever, they don't have the exact same kind of freedoms or abilities that we do, and that's a social contract. It's a social governing thing uh, that we all agree to. So the ultimate social contract is the dollar because it's basically backed by confidence. It's not backed by anything anymore. Um, <clears throat> After World War II in 1944, right at the end of World War II, there was a meeting in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, and all the superpowers at the time got together and said, look, we're going to, in exchange for all global trade being done in dollars, we're basically going to, the United States is going to protect the trade routes of the world. And what that means is that we get to print as much money as we can or as much as we want. Because you, if the world's going to use dollars, whether you're Japan trading with Europe or whoever, we have to have enough liquidity or cash out in the system for them to trade, which allows us to run deficits. So you can make an argument that debt is actually our biggest export, and it's what affords us the ability to have a reserve currency status because it's, we just need to put so much out there. 
So fast forward to 2008, everything collapsed, people got greedy, and essentially central banks, you could say colluded or collaborated to print 20 trillion plus for US equivalent in dollars. If you're really into this, there's a woman named Naomi Prinz. She wrote a book called Collusion. It's really good. She's an amazing researcher. She did a ton of uh, work on this. It's awesome. It explains how it all works. Um, so now we don't really know what the hell's going on. I mean, the derivatives markets, what crashed, housing at least, and now there's over 600 trillion, they think, still out. And all that fake money creation just totally inflated asset prices. So last year, uh, a Da Vinci, Salvatore Mundi, sold for $450 million and it doesn't make any sense. And then if you look at how we also calculate uh, unemployment, say for government statistics, we count people who are collecting unemployment insurance and aren't actually looking for work. So it's a way to kind of, the statistics work technically, but they're not actually what's reflecting reality. So we could run deficits, meaning we could print and spend more than we can actually create in terms of GDP or economic wealth. But now deficits are gonna matter. <coughs> Excuse me because we have oncoming li liabilities with Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Social Security, and then demographics, meaning all the baby boomers that pushed the massive expansion post-World War II, they're starting to retire and they're living longer because technology is enabling us to live longer and have better qualities of life. So the dollar is gonna break sooner or later and it's really about hegemonic control. And our thesis is that by legalizing cannabis, you're actually simultaneously legalizing the potential for industrial hemp. And this is where the next big commodity, like gold or oil, is gonna come from. So oil and gold used to back the dollar up until about the 70s. I mean, oil still does to an extent. Um, you can make an argument about that, but our bigger argument is that it's gonna be your data, your information, plus industrial hemp, that's gonna be the next wave. And so we're not gonna do details now, but Frank's gonna get into it in a second, about the actual uh, market opportunity is in the trillions of dollars if you calculate food, energy, new scale composites, and the uh, carbon neutrality or beneficiality you get uh, from growing. So when you legalize something and the whole world says it's illegal, what you would get to do is you get to go open up the world trade agreements. And it's a really clever way to, to back hack the whole system because instead of electing officials who are supposed to represent your opinion, and you know, vote in what you voted in, you're changing the standards that govern the system. So it's kind of like changing the laws of gravity or physics for how everything kind of interacts. So it's, it's very clever, but changing standards is essentially what's gonna happen. And the real game is about who's gonna get hegemonic control. Is it gonna be, people argue, is it gonna be the US still? Is it gonna be China? This is a whole other conversation. But after all of central bank collusion, all this money printing, everybody got kind of synced up. And if you read Neil Howe, he's a demographer and an economist. He's the guy who coined the term millennials. And he wrote a book called The Fourth Turning. So essentially, humans live about 80 years, give or take, in the modern world. And Neil Howe talks about there's four cycles, 20 years each, that happen. At the end of the fourth turning, it always ends in revolution or war. And our argument is that we're actually in the middle of a revolution right now, except instead of bombs, it's bits of information that's being leveraged to control and essentially SE the world at large. So I also study astrology, and you can believe what you want, but for me, it's very interesting. It's, it's an interesting way to look at long-term cycles over periods of time, and it's just say, oh, um, you know, such and such sun sign or whatever. But, so the way to read this is this little green P guy and the black guy. So the black guys on the inside, those are the cross-section of where the United States, if it had a chart, was born at that time, and the green on the exterior is where the planets are now. So the two Ps are Pluto, and it's inside Capricorn. Capricorn basically represents the patriarchy, the structure, the system, the monolith, the, the top-down hegemonic control, and Pluto is all about transformation. And so when these guys line up, which takes 250 years, it's essentially like a phoenix rising kind of baptism by fire moment, and everything's being renegotiated right now. So even over, according to the stars, if you believe this kind of thing, temporally, we're right on point for that too. Now, on the bottom, this little green dude looks like a little trident. That's Neptune. He's about to go into Aries. And the last time this happened was the Civil War of the United States. So you can believe what you want, but I think it's interesting looking at long-term cycles. Um, and then you just have to look all around you. And this is in New York City. Um, you look in the back. This is like one of those little walk, don't walk signs. But the text says, until there's equal accountability for murder, it is totally fair to kill cops. And if that's not a crisis of the social contract, I don't know what is. 
Politicians never let a good crisis go to waste. That's one main thing you learn from uh, studying the narcotics, specifically the legalization or the prohibition of cannabis. The whole reason we're in this pickle today is because powers that be wanted to move us forward very slowly, very calculated to a global world dominated, controlled, centralized force. Now, the clever vehicle they used was drugs. Most famously, oh, there you go. It was about uh, 120 years ago. Uh, countries started to get together to discuss about how to trade certain things uh, internationally, specifically narcotics. Now, they used the guise of an opium crisis. Uh, that sounds familiar. Today, we're seeing the same headlines. Uh, politicians are pushing that like it was the new bread and butter. Oh, my God, everybody, the opium crisis. Well, the opium crisis we've been under for about the past three, 400 years. Uh, turn of the century into 1900, scientists were synthesizing uh, opium into heroin and other byproducts that became extremely addictive and were scourges, really, on the society. So how in the world did cannabis, which represents zero deaths when used, I mean, literally, you can smoke as much as you want to. I mean, you may get a little paranoid and whatnot, but you're not going to die. How in the world has cannabis been grouped into this large, homogenous narcotics moniker? And specifically, how in the world did hemp get there? Hemp doesn't even have any psychotropic effects. It's all about control, guys. It's interesting, too, because we find today that we're being controlled by language. We're being pushed narratives here and there. And it's always being about labeling something or someone as bad and, and using that label then to not really see them as human anymore. So the powers that be, as time progressed from The Hague on through, through World War I and then after World War I into the Roaring Twenties, the world was going through dramatic change. Specifically, the United States was uh, really putting themselves out there as the dominant world power. They made sure, along with partners in other nation states, to put forward language that held their ideas in place, and specifically to control populations. Now, the language that was used uh, was to then bulk hemp together with cannabis, cannabis being cannabis indica and cannabis sativa. Now, hemp is actually a cannabis sativa offshoot, but that's another story. Now, they cleverly disguised what was the top king commodity, the builder of wells of nations. Uh, they disguised that and brought it down to the most ethereal level by demonizing the user. Users were depicted as crazed lunatics. Uh, basically, any scourge in society was blamed on marijuana. Now, what the real fact was, and what they were really hiding, was that during the same time, prohibition of alcohol was a huge failure. Uh, what prohibition did, basically, was overnight created a swath of population that was once legal and law-abiding to then all of a sudden criminals just because of consuming something that was legal a few months before. This gave rise to a huge gray market and really changed the, the flow and direction of not only this country, but the world. And now we find ourselves 100 years in after prohibition of marijuana in a system where the user is demonized, controlled, held away from holding a job, held away in prison. Over 50% of people that were arrested over the past 100 years were arrested over marijuana charges. Now, if that's not control, I don't know what is. So as time progressed, I mean, the user of marijuana, again, labeled as a degenerate. I mean, we all know Spicoli. Spicoli was a burnout. And basically, that narrative was then continued through in the counterculture to control that population just the same. 
And really at the essence of it all is it's all about narrating and controlling the message. And media is just slapping us around and really pile drying us onto the mat and just shredding our brain and the ability to really think, think and free thought for ourselves. I mean, man has forever been trying to consolidate their information and knowledge and pass it on to future generations. In our lifetimes, that was left mostly to what is the mainstream media. But now we find ourselves, and mainstream media, I should say, finds itself more as a paid PR machine. They're really a, a shell of them former selves. I mean, this is the magazine rack at the very back of the CBS. They're not even in the front anymore. Consolidation of all these media companies, too, shows centralization of control. But what's ironic is these guys were the ones that forward the message of the evil crazed reefer madness marijuana user to forward the prohibition of marijuana. But then, ironically today, these companies are the same ones that are putting out these kind of population uh, propagandas. What is their motivation now? I mean. Back in the day, Hearst basically lobbied because he owned all the paper interests to get rid of marijuana because he didn't want hemp to be messing with all the forests that he was getting his paper from. Point being, we have come and have grown up in a society where, aside from debt, up until 10 years ago, the number one export in the United States was entertainment industry. And it brings us to today, like I was saying. Every population or every uh, publications now are, are really just embracing weed. Why? I mean, it, what's interesting enough too is that today I think we are in a special place and time in humanity. There's no more hiding the truth. I mean, we have information at our fingertips and really it, it travels at the speed of light, it encompasses all of what is the uh, knowledge of humanity at the, at the hands of just a quick search on a, a, a search engine page. Now imagine that control, I mean, what, what kind of control do these companies really have? Now we find ourselves in the same kind of position we were 100 years ago when legalization wasn't a thing. I mean, when, when, say, prohibition of marijuana was coming into play. These same forces now are leveraging their control to control humanity through different ways. Specifically, I don't want to beat up on Google because every single one of these tech companies are guilty in their own right. But what's happening is the same ways and uses of controlling humanity are being played out today, but just on a different scale. And what this means is that we are again finding ourselves uh, as humans, as individuals, being controlled by greater forces beyond us. If humans aren't allowed to spread information and spread their free will, how are we ever going to become empowered? How are we ever going to uh, head towards the future and really get past what is the level that we're on now? We're never going to have a Renaissance tout pour un when you can never share what is your thoughts with the rest of society. The problem here is that now these companies are worth more than nation states. These nation states are the ones that created what is the social contracts that we live on today. It's a race to the top. And at the top, you don't want to give up your control. So a lot of these companies are leveraging that to make sure that they're always in place. And nation states are leveraging their partnerships with these international entities to control their populations. What's at stake? Are we really gonna go back to the days when you can't even say shit, fuck, crap, whatever the fuck you want to? Am I gonna be charged a token every time I say those kind of things? Like Demolition Man? Uh, am I gonna be threaded and put to jail just because of my thoughts or what I may be thinking for the future? 
are we all, and we are, going to become victims of manipulated media? The pen is still mightier than the sword, so this is why these controlling companies really are fearing the individual freedom of humanity. It's always been about control. But without understanding the individuality and the essence of what is the Enlightenment, the Magna Carta, the social contracts that really are the bedrock of our societies today, we will not be able to get into what is the future of Renaissance 2.0. So it's up to each one of us to take off the blinders and start seeing what is the reality. Because if we don't, we won't understand the true costs of what we're doing and how we are taking the direction of, of society and most importantly about empowering the individual and free will. These are part of the bedrocks of the social contract that we live under today. And those very foundations are what are being attacked and eroded daily. What's it going to be? Because if we don't start talking about renegotiating this social contract and weigh things that are happening today, others will do the thinking and changing for us. And you might not like the outcome that they bring. So it takes us back to the root of the enlightenment, the creation of what is this social contract we live under today. Will hemp, will cannabis and legalization bring us to the next revolution? I should say industrial revolution or the revolution of free thought and humanity? I believe so. <clears throat> All right, so entitlements, taxes, and payment systems. All right, right now we have not had a national debt lar this large since World War II. We're in the hole for over $20 trillion. That's a crazy amount of money. So on top of that, we can't afford all our liabilities, meaning Social Security, Medicare, uh, Medicaid, and depending on how you look at the accounting, we could basically be bankrupt by 2030. So when you look at accounting, accounting isn't truth. Accounting is how you account or how you count numbers. And it's very easy to hide things. Uh, and this is basically what's been going on to breach our social contract. And right now, politicians are gaining, gaining steam for new cohorts based on new ideas to try and, you know, better humanity. But you have to find a way to pay for all these things, not everything. You, you, you can't do it for free. So when you have all this debt, there's only three ways in economics to get out of it. You inflate, you grow, or you tax. Inflation means you print a bunch more money, which is basically it, it lowers the cost of what you have. You grow or you have more economic uh, power or you actually produce more stuff or you tax. And what's going to happen if we don't do that is essentially you default. And depending on who you talk to, whether it's like a Jim Rickards kind of guy or other ec economists, what the real game is about is who the race to the bottom right now. Because if it's Japan or the uh, Bank of China or the EU, whoever is going to default first is going to precipitate a larger kind of crisis. But that's what you're seeing in all the trade wars going on right now is who's going to push you to the over the brink first. So we're talking about taxing. That's obviously what's always been sold before. So for example, in Colorado, uh, and when you look at the whole um, supply chain, the grower gets taxed going to the retailer and the retailer gets taxed going to the consumer. But this isn't going to pay for what it was promised to pay for. Because what happens is, is in the 40s and 50s, once all the soldiers came home from World War II, they were promised pensions because legally, according to the, well, the law that got passed, they couldn't raise rates or you couldn't have a better wage. So what they did is have these things called fringe benefits where you have social security, you have, um, not social security, but uh, like healthcare, better healthcare and pensions. And that's what we can't afford to pay right now. And this actually happened in Jersey too where the lottery was created and it was supposed to pay for all the stuff for education and it, it didn't really end up making that much of a dent at all. So the other side of this too is a war on cash. And a war, on, if, you, if, you, if you think back about how can you do actually transactions that you don't want to be traced, it's either with cash or pretty much gold right now. And the cannabis market, at least that we found in the United States, is about a $50 billion industry, which is the biggest cash only market that's untraceable in the world, save for like, you know, illicit markets or black markets. Um, and you can't get in the banking system because no one wants to touch the whole KYC and the Know Your Customer and all the regulations that go with it because the banks are so large right now that they'll just essentially cut you out. And the banks can do that, even on the personal level. So if you read the terms of service of your checking account whenever you opened it up, the bank can close your account at will for whatever reason and not tell you 
just like Facebook or Instagram can cut you off too. So even as an individual, if you have no bank account, you, you can't survive, you can't pay a utility bill, you can't function, you can't go to like a check cashing place all the time and drop a W-2 or your paychecks off there to kind of make it happen. So all this means that everything gets digital, it's all traceable and therefore it's all taxable and this is what the United States actually does. So there's a thing called the SWIFT payment system which is the international way that countries and big uh, corporations pay each other uh, and Russia and China have actually called to get out of it because the United States put political pressure on Russia after Crimea to try and control them. And instead of enforcing hard power you know, with the military or soft power through sanctions, Europe didn't want to do it because they're getting all their energy from Russia. So the US said, all right, screw it, we're going to do it this way. And this is why if you do the research, all these countries are buying crazy amounts of gold right now. So the idea is that they'll default on dollars at some point. They'll say, all right, thanks, call you back. And then they'll do what's called a collateralized loan based on gold. So they'll take the gold, say, okay, here's how much we have and now we're gonna renegotiate back with a crypto-backed SDR. So it will go digital, but it's basically gonna be a non-country uh, backed social contract. It'll be like a world-backed money. Uh, renewable energy. We got 15 minutes, all right. So looking ahead, there's like four billion people that haven't come online yet. And you know, we're here at DEF CON hacking badges and you know, <laughs> looking at the Wi-Fi and whatnot, but there's still half the world is not on the internet yet. And we just can't provide the same lifestyle for the whole world that we've been used to with air conditioners and all this power consumption because our energy needs are growing exponentially. And that's the problem. I mean, basically we built this past 150 years industrial revolution on finite instead of renewable. And this needs to change. I mean, it's very clear. I mean, we have uh, garbage patches uh, full of plastic the size of Texas in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Hemp has a unique ability to change that and to empower, again, nation states, humanity to move forward and pass the finite history that we've built our now society on. There's no longer, you can't turn away from what is the problems anymore. I mean, humanity has made their mark on this planet. This planet's going to be here regardless if we're here or not. We need to make a change and we need to uh, choose a direction that is about empowering futures for generations upon generations of generations of humans moving forward. So was the word plastics derived in the wrong way? Was it derived from the wrong materials? Today, really, hemp allows us to change the way we are impacting our environment in a very unique way because it's a renewable resource, a renewable commodity. The beauty of hemp and cannabis is that, specifically hemp, uh, it can be used to really backstop what is our social contract, the dollar. Now how it's being used today uh, as far as legalization goes, if you look on Twitter, every single politician keeps on pushing out, hey, farm bill this, farm bill that, look, we got hemp for you. The beauty of it is it literally overnight we can turn a zero, or I should say domestic, about a billion dollar a year uh, commodity into trillions within a year to three years time. Aside from the economic impact, of course, the environmental impact of growing all that hemp and cannabis is greatly beneficial. Aside from aerating soil and the, the, all the other important things that it does as far as for the environment, it actually cleans the air better than any other plant that exists, period. So in essence, why? <coughs> wouldn't we embrace hemp? Why wouldn't we embrace cannabis moving forward? Uh, oil resources are being depleted. Ironically enough, the United States now finds itself as a lead exporter of oil and petrol. Together with cannabis and usurping data, this puts the United States and the dollar in a unique position to really float itself into the future. Now what that future will be God knows, but we all can understand that marijuana is going mainstream. 
I mean, the other day my grandma asked if she could get some CBD. I mean, that to me, wow. So we find ourselves today where uh, more than half the population here domestically is in favor of legalization of cannabis being the consumable products. Now, if you really look at cannabis specifically here in this uh, little diagram over here, it's more about uh, cannabis indica sativa. You really get to see the size uh, of cannabis relative to all other cash crops. I mean, it dwarfs. I mean, all other crops are dwarfed by cannabis. You literally can make 20 times the amount of money growing cannabis on the same plot of land that you could growing corn or soybean. Talk about really uh, empowering our farmers, huh? Marijuana is everywhere. I mean, in Los Angeles, where I live presently, I just pull up my weed maps. I can see a doctor right next to me. I can get any delivery service. I look at a mall. It's uh, right at my fingertips, literally. <laughs> I don't even have to leave my home. The things can come to me as long as I put the order in. And actually, it's kind of cheaper because you don't have to even deal with any uh, retail space and all that stuff. But what it really comes down to cannabis, the smoking, the edibles, the medical side of it, is just a fingernail on the body of what is cannabis as a whole and as a cash crop, the golden commodity. I think, uh, I should say the nation got a little bit of God, I guess, uh, back uh, in World War II when they needed hemp. So they actually went from the uh, prohibition to 10 years later saying, hey, go for it, guys, grow as much hemp as you possibly can. Even Ford got on board. They built cars in 1941, built solely out of hemp. Hemp is 10 times stronger than steel when it's composited material. Hemp can be used as ethanol, way more efficient than using corn. And where we find ourselves today, Mercedes Daimler, BMW, they're actually uh, making all their new renewable energy conscious cars out of hemp. Hemp really is the building block for our future. It can go into almost anything you can possibly imagine. From lightweight hempcrete, to medicines, to ethanol, to energy uses, to plastics, you name it. And it's becoming a part of mainstream culture as well. I mean, this is a screenshot I took from L Magazine. L Magazine actually printed a Woman in Weed articles uh, in a whole publication like this one this past month uh, with supplementary webpage that literally went through all the nice and neat cool things that cannabis can do for you for the new millennial. But really at, at heart of it all, it's about harvesting liberty. And every company and their mom is getting on this board. Patagonia, of course. So really, we're getting back to the essence of where we started. And I believe that the world is going to need cannabis in order to spring forward. And they're going to need that in order to backstop the social contracts they have with their citizenry. But the beauty of it all is about empowering humanity. And through that is about sharing the free flow of information. Now, the antithesis of that is the controlling of that very information and data. Now, we are at the precipice of understanding all the secrets of the universe. Uh, here, right here, is the whole genome sequence of uh, man, humans, um, mapped out. Basically, what is going to be our future? I mean, every company is racing to make sure that they control whatever is their bedrock uh, to wealth. Uh, today we find that is knowledge, data, genome sequences. But really, in reality, if we leverage all this information, if we leverage the king commodity and all these commodities together, it will take us to the stars and beyond. Imagine being able to populate 
the billions upon trillions of universes around the world and being powered and being brought there specifically by cannabis. All right, so the social contract of the future. So we talked about how the dollar's breaking down, the system's breaking down, and everything's being called into question at large. So in order for anything to really improve, you really need to have human-centered design systems. And if you read any corporate monologue, they talk about being customer-centric, human-centric, but they're not really doing that. They're not really looking at what are the unmet needs, how do you solve them simply, how do you look at this idea of shared value creation. So as a real simple rule or a kind of model, you could look at this idea of simplicity, convenience, and trust. So simplicity is when you have an unmet need, how do you solve it really simply? So like Amazon does this good with like one click, Wikipedia does this with like one click editing. It's literally how do you get rid of as much friction as possible in the system. Convenience is really simple. It's the idea of how do you improve my length of quality of life or how do you give me my time back? At the end of the day, your time, your energy, your mind, and your health, say for your relationships, are you know, your precious resources that you have access to. And lastly, it's trust. Um, would you actually advocate this to friends and family, and are you being consistent along the interaction? So when you do that, this is how you actually unlock real novelty and creativity and add value back to society, and that's what this is all about, is by empowering people to be free to speak their truth and to do things that actually resonate with what is their you know, quintessential being. Thanks. We'll open up the floor to any questions if you have. And I guess with that, uh, cannabis is our future. Embrace right, it. Thanks, guys. <laughs>